Good morning. I want to talk a little bit about Savage Worlds um, Deluxe. I own the 2012 um, paperback book. It's available on Amazon. I think it's still available on Amazon for $10. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic game system and book for just $10. However, there is a newer version, I believe, called the Adventure. Savage Worlds Adventures is a uh, is the newest edition. Um, I think it's 15 total, 15 or so years old, maybe 18 years old, Savage Worlds. So I'm co I've come to Savage Worlds uh, roughly 10 years ago. Well, 2012, right, is when I got this book. So that would be uh, uh, 10 years ago. At some point during that 10 years, I was able to run uh, two sessions for uh, Steve Robert. I think I ran one for Robert and Steve, um, and then I believe I ran just um, one for uh, Brian, Harold, and Steve. But I cannot recall all those details, and um, I'm not going to go out in, in, into my storage and look for the the session notes. Um, but it would be kind of cool to go back and look at that. Uh, I recall liking it. I recall that it um, at times I as a GM. Um, felt overwhelmed because there's there's lots of, of, of very cool things in Savage Worlds, but I thought I'd really quickly go through a video here on, on and just for the heck of it, in a way for me, because I think the best way to learn is to be able to explain to other people what you think you know about something, right? So how do I know I've learned Savage Worlds or how do I know I'm learning Savage Worlds? I should be able to communicate what I know. And so it's a great way, too, to make kind of a cheat sheet video for any of the guys in the group that might want to uh, uh, play this. Um, uh, I will, at some point, run some Savage Worlds. And um, I may come to Savage Worlds late, right? I may be a Savage Worlds late bloomer. But as I have fully experienced all kinds of other games, and I appreciate why system is designed the way it is in all these games, some I enjoy more as a GM, some I enjoy as a player more. Um, uh, Savage Worlds is one of those that it, it's um, it's I feel once I've once I've grasped some of the subtle nuances as a GM, it'll be something I would really enjoy uh, uh, running for players. So, so let's just talk first about the the thing that's always first in these books. As a matter of fact, it's first in this book, and that is um, character gen. So character gen, it's uh, it's uh, so uh, uh, character gen. <coughs> is basically point buy, all right? You buy dice, you buy attribute dice scores. Okay, well, let's, let's go up to the top. Let's, let's get right down to the bones of it first. This game uses all your dice, all your um, dice. And what I mean by that is your D4, your D6, your D8, your D10, your D12, all of our favorite dice from our favorite uh, old school game, but kind of D20 meh, right? I mean, it comes up some some settings and some things might use a D20, but really that is uh, irrelevant to 90% of what we're going to do, especially if we're if we're just you know. And I'm this, and one of the reasons I love this particular book is we can do any genre with Savage Worlds, and I'm the kind of guy that likes to set up a, a setting let the players create interesting characters for that particular setting and then again now that I use naive narrator and random seeds to kind of populate the uh, uh, what occurs in front of the players once they take off uh, I love the idea right that um, uh, they can create characters that are really interesting suit them right so well, what's very cool about this is these dice are, are rolled for whatever uh, attribute they're assigned to. Uh, we have so many points to assign. So think of D4 is a poor attribute, D6 is your average attribute, and then we start getting a little more competent. Eventually we become the, the highest attribute power you can have. Uh, the, the attributes are pretty uh, self-explanatory. They're similar to most of these types of games, and I'll give you a quick synopsis. Agility, smart, spirit, strength, and vigor, right? So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Um, and there you have it, right? Then we have skills. Uh, skills, you get 15 points uh, to purchase skills. Um, and uh, a skill costs you one point per base die. If you want to have a higher skill value, then you're gonna, it's going to cost you two 
to go up a point. Uh, so, so it gets, starts getting expensive to, to move your skills up out of the gate. Then we derive some statistics, char uh, charisma, pace, parry, and toughness. These are derivative scores that, that uh, utilize um, your attributes. Um, and then we have edges and hindrances. This is very cool. <coughs> so, you know, you get you get five points, you know, to <coughs> to choose your attributes. Uh, I can't spell attributes, right? Uh, and those are, um, oh gosh, I forgot again. Shoot, for some reason I'm wanting to say strength. I want to start with strength, and that makes me think D&D. Agility, smarts, spirit. Edge, smarts, spirit, uh, vigor, right? One, two, three, four. Oh, dumb. Agility, smarts, vigor, strength. There is strength. See, this was messing me up. It's just not in the same order of my and vigor, right? Okay. And they all start at D4. So when 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 in play, the uh, I say, you know what? You need to make an agility check here, Adele to make this uh, jump. Uh, he only has a D4. If, let's say it's a D4 in his agility. He only gets to roll the D4 plus a D6. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this other thing that makes this game very cool is all characters are wild cards. Right? Matter of fact, we'll call this character... Uh, uh, how about this? We'll call this character Jin. All right, point by... Oop, point by... And these are wild cards. Uh, villains, key, major NPCs and villains are also wild cards. Uh, there's also henchmen, minions, that kind of thing that aren't wild cards. What's very cool about this game, you'll see in a sec. So I would get to roll the D4. Target number is, is always, TN is always 4. So we never modify the TN, it really. Uh, we modify your roll against the TN. You have to get a 4 to succeed. So you can imagine, Dell. if I said to Dell. And this is basic math, folks. I say, Dell, I need you to make an agility uh, score to jump the uh, pit. And Dell has an agility score of D4. Right? Drum roll, please, folks. What does that mean? Dell has a 25% chance to make that. Right? He has to roll A4. Right? <clears throat> okay, but Dell also has bennies to spin to re-roll anything right any agility trait check he can use a Benny so Bennies are only useful for re-rolling or rolling or re-rolling all the dice or one die etc for Bennies but remember he always rolls a wild card die which is always a d6 this is the wild card so in a way players have a cool uh, advantage uh, player characters are better than the average guy in the world that's why we're playing them so you're never you're not really zero to hero you are the protagonist of the tale. That's what makes Savage Worlds interesting. Right out of the gate, we have technically what's called a wild card dice. It's always a D6, and you always get to roll it with any trait check or a, or a attribute check, right? You do not get to roll it with damage. You don't get to roll it with other things, but there it is. So Dell says, hey, I got a 25% chance. But he always rolls this really nice D6. Let's and now he's got 25, right? And then he's got um, uh, a little better than um, let's see here, 16, 33 percent chance, you know, on the D6. So the wild card die gives him four or five. So that's 50 percent. Excuse me. All he needs is my math is great. So really, he's got about a 50 percent chance with the D6 alone to succeed. So. Even even a base check of his agility, uh, it's almost like a. Um, so you roll both dice together, d4 plus d6, and you use the better score. You don't add them up; you use the better score. So I roll a one on my d4, right? But I get a five on my d6. Success, and we continue. Then we narrate. Uh, we don't even have to narrate that. The easy step across the pit. Uh, as Dell continues to run away from the zombies, right? So very cool, and I'm probably talking too fast, but the gist of it is this: these are considered considered traits, and they're always T and target numbers always four. Uh, most modifiers are going to be minus two, minus four, minus six, and that's to your roll, not to the target number, right? So this won't go up to six, won't go up to eight. It stays T four. 
we modify your dice roll. Mod dice roll by minus two, minus four, minus six. Okay, so combat you would maybe at short range it's T and four if it's a uh, shooting at long at um, at uh, 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 medium range it's a minus two and at a long range it's a minus four. So if if I if you say you're shooting at the car from behind barrels in a, in an alley and uh, it's a medium range shot you're going to be subtracting two from that shooting skill check right plus other things uh, like damage cover things like that as well so that's roughly how the system works now what's cool again is we have traits right these are basically your attributes all right whoops I'm really doing a great job spelling here folks I, again I'm using the editor I love the text editor we have skills and skills exactly the same D4 you can assign when you pick skills the value of and you do want of course the higher number okay D12 for skill checks um, of course skills have are identified in the book and they also have they, they go as far as even having other things like tables and this is one of the things I think is so cool about Savage Worlds so Savage Worlds <laughs> Uh, and this is something that's, uh, I don't know if anybody, any other game really does this, but Savage Worlds, for instance, I have Persuasion as a skill, right? Uh, and I'm going to make my Charisma, Persuasion, Roll, whatever, right? But what's very cool is it has a reaction table actually under Persuasion. Right, so very cool. So that same kind of reaction table that we all know from, say, Dungeons and Dragons, that's kind of just there, used for when you run into a goblin or when you're going to communicate with a goblin, etc. It's very cool. Let me find it here in the book. Make sure I'm not misunderstanding this. I believe it is under the skill, not just. Uh, a, it's not a reaction table in general. However, I think you could use it that way. It is. Shoot under the skill, which is very cool, and I cannot find the damn thing. Are you kidding me? Well, hmm. I must have lied. I can't find it in the book. See, I was trying to go all of this without, without um, uh, reading the without going to the book. But I want to make sure I'm not completely wrong here. Uh, it's amazing. It's actually a very, very interesting uh, system, uh, and it's almost a shame I'm coming to it so, so late. In uh, but what you know, a better late than never is the adage I plan on playing for a long, long time. There is no reason that Savage Worlds couldn't become uh, a, a, a fantastic alternate system for me. I can't find it in here, dang it. Okay, but it, it the, the, the actual reaction table is under, I believe, the skill persuasion, which is just kind of neat, right? And then you roll two dice six um, and, and, and reference that table, which is kind of cool. Okay, anyway, um, so the gist of... Uh, okay, then we have, of course... Uh, so you are a wild card. The character PC is a wild card, right? That means they get, they always get that extra D6. They have binnies to spend. Binnies let them re-roll traits, right? Uh, excuse me, re-roll trait checks, right? Very cool. And then, of course, binnies are awarded at the beginning of the game. You start the game with three, but you earn them, earn them role play uh, so again this is another thing I love about this I want players to be in character I want players to think like their characters I don't expect players to be actors so that's that's one of the things I think people get confused at role playing is not acting role playing is just acting like your character is designed to act if your character is a coward and you take a hindrance that he's a coward don't act like a don't suddenly have your character act like a hero, right? He's a coward. You should take that into account when you make decisions as your character. Uh, if you're going to role play, you know, a 
a particular type of personality, um, then think about that when you make decisions. That's all. But anyway, uh, so good, through good role play, through uh, through uh, entertaining everybody at the table, through something fun and funny, the GM is free to award a Benny to player, uh, a player. Also, the GM gets Benny's, right? And the GM gets Benny's for his wild cards to spin. And he has the wild cards, which again are the evil villains, the top uh, monsters, whatever. The wild cards are those that are uh, basically equal to the player characters. They're more dangerous villains, okay? But the GM also gets Benny's for use uh, for those characters, which is cool. And again, they're awarded those through gameplay, right? If a... If a uh, uh, so that's a very very interesting piece, right? This is a lot of this stuff. My experiences with 2D20, um, Doom and Threat uh, from Star Trek 2D20, uh, excuse me, Conan 2D20, and then my 2D20 Star Trek, which is Threat and um, oh shoot, I can't remember. Uh, it's called Threat, and uh, the players call it something else for players. Shoot, I can't remember what the name is, but it's the same mechanic, different titles for them. With the with the what the Benny is basically. <laughs> Uh, Ubiquity, I believe, has something, and you have to forgive me, I haven't played or looked at Ubiquity in years, but again, Ubiquity also offers uh, something like this, and again, I think a lot of games do, but but my experience uh, with, with this type of mechanic came first with Ubiquity and 2D20 before um, I really uh, uh, paid attention to Savage Worlds, however... Uh, Obviously, when I ran it, I knew of Bendy's. I just had, uh, never really thought much about it because I, I didn't play. You know, part of it is too. I seem to I seem to take more in about a game when I get to play it first versus GM it. When I'm GMing it, um, you have to know it all, but I'm, you're so busy administering the game and 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 and, and involved in so many things. Um, I don't think uh, I recognize the value of those things too. The system until I see how it affects me as a player, and I know that sounds a little strange. For instance, um, 2D20. For instance, um, I took I soaked in a ton from reading, but then I soaked in the most from being a player, and I could process through being a player in 2D20 how that would affect me as a GM. The idea of how Doom was awarded to the GM as a player, I knew I was going to be giving Doom points to the GM by doing a thing. And I can imagine how that would affect me as a GM. Um, so I tend to, I tend to kind of be reversed. I think I've GM'd so much in my life that we tend to again fall into habits, or we tend to play the game very, especially when it's a new experience. Whether you're forgetting stuff, or we, we, we might make we might be doing something a little wrong, so we're learning bad habits. But uh, you're so in a way caught up with all the other things you must do as a GM that I don't always take in how it's how how it's affecting play, right? As a player, I'm always more relaxed because, you know, uh, I'm only in charge of my character and I need to know the rules that, that my character is responsible for, that I as a player am responsible for. So, the other thing I really dig about Savage Worlds is, uh, of course, I, I really dig the, um, uh, I guess you could argue this is the pros, right? The things I like about it, right? The pros. I don't really want to get a lot into the cons because I haven't played it enough to actually decide if things are cons. But I'll, t I'll, I'll mention a couple of things that I'm not a real fan of, right? Okay. And then, of course, we have, as I said before, we have hindrances. When you make your character, you get to pick hindrances. Those hindrances will give you either an edge, which is like a special thing, right? Uh, an edge would be like, well, let me look it up. I'll give you an example. I'll just go straight to hedge. edges. Um so if you take a major and minor hindrances, those are role play. A lot of them are just role play options, but a lot of them are actual things you have to take into play. For instance, here's a great hindrance for a minor hindrance. Could be major, but let's say it could be minor hindrance. Bad eyes. There's a 50% chance, uh, you know, um, that's, uh, here's a chance. With glasses, there's no penalty and hindrance is only minor. Should you lose your glasses, now you're in a minus two penalty when making all trade rolls or shooting. If you lose your glasses in a low tech setting where the hero cannot wear glasses, bad eyes is a major hindrance, and you're always subtracting two from trait rolls made to attack or notice things within five inches or more. And that is not that is game inches. Uh, that is actual uh, mini uh, maps and minis inches, not um, or should I say five feet? No, it says inches here. That would be so. That would be uh, yards. That would be 
uh, like two yards. Uh, so 10 would be two yards, I think. And five inches would be a yard and a half or something like that. Anyway, if you're trying to do the math, they tell you to, to, to translate that to yards if you're playing theater of the mind. So there's an example of Dell. Here's a great example. Dell loves to make characters that have flaws. Uh, there's a flaw, uh, bad eyes, uh, anemic, arrogant, uh, things like that. So they give you more points to either put into your trades uh, or you can have more cash when you start the game or you can take an edge and an edge is something like uh, alertness, berserk, brave. Edges remind me a lot. Quick, brawny, rich, filthy, rich. You know, there's things like that. Improved, frenzy. Uh, so edges are like, what is it in D&D? &D? Uh, they call them, uh, you know, um, talents, I think, in D&D. &D, something like that. So, pretty cool. So when you build your character, you can really flesh out, you know, his flaws give him an edge or just improve some of his traits or skills or you can start the game with a little more cash pretty neat right okay so and, and, and also uh, the combat so what's cool about combat and of course the dice blow up by the way so um, uh, if you roll the highest number on the die anytime you make a check it, it blows up and you get to keep rolling uh, until you don't blow up again and those can be used to activate what are called raises so we always need a four right we never need a two we never need a six we always need a four we modify the dice roll to make this more difficult we do not make it an eight or a six so the, when this makes calculating a raise for every time you drop the dice easy a raise occurs when I double triple the number, right? So a raise occurs at an 8 or more. A raise occurs, a, a second raise occurs at a 12 or more. 16 or more. Raises, right? So raises are basically tiers of success. So if I roll a 4, I just achieve it. And if I get a, a 4 through 7, I'm successful. No raise. But I get an 8. That's a, that's a simple raise. And then, of course, 9, 10, 11, I'm still at one simple raise, but if I hit 12, I have now earned a second raise. And if I manage, let's say, blowing up dice rolls to hit 16, right, or um, I said it's two times, three times, four times, five times, 20, the next raise would come at 20. You can see, you can collect some raises here, right? This is the raise. Raises occur. And I'll just quickly tell you what exactly the raise means for those who are wondering. Well, still, what does a raise do? All right. Where am I at? Oh, here it is. I was telling you about the reaction table. Persuasion is under spirit. So you, when you make persuasion checks, your guiding trait is spirit. Um. And then react if the game master doesn't already have an initial attitude in mind for the extra, the extra are the enemies, right? The NPCs. He can roll on the chart below and use a reaction table. He does not need to use a reaction table. So the other night in our mothership game with Justin, he already knew the mentality of the android woman, and so he may or he may have chose at some point to use reaction table if he wanted to give uh, me a fighting chance. But he already knew the actual mentality of the extra. But he could use this reaction table, so it's very cool. You don't have to use it, obviously. It's something the GM can use. But there's that. I was talking about that earlier. Edges, all right, where's my raises again? Dang it, see, I'm having trouble finding all of it here. I can quickly talk about this. Um, gear, background details, of course. Well, now... Do, 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 do. Character creation gear. I'm trying to get to rules. Here we go. Rules, Jason. Aces. All trait tests are damage rolls, and damage rolls and savage rolls are open ended. That means if you hit the highest number on the die, it blows up. You get to keep rolling until you don't do it anymore. This is called an ace. So instead of saying it blew up the dice, if I roll a uh, if I roll on my D6 wild card 6, that means I've aced that wild card roll, and I would get to keep rolling that wild card and adding to the number. Okay, so I didn't just succeed, but, I, or let's say for instance, I was shooting long range and my wild card came up, uh, 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 excuse me, medium range, 
And so I actually need a six to be successful. I roll on my wild card a six. I'm just barely successful, but I get to add to that by rolling. Therefore, that's the chance for me to get over that negative six. So when you say, how can you do that if it's minus two, there's no way to achieve that. Well, sure there is because I can, I can ace a die roll. Okay. That's how we can overcome big disadvantages, right? And then raise it. Sometimes it's important to know just how successful a trade test was. Every four points over what you need for success is called a raise. So it's four points, right? So TM, four points over this is eight, four points over this is 12, right? And there we go. And the raise is, if your hero needs a four to shoot the opponent and rolls an 11, he hits with one raise. That would be that eight range. He would have two raises with a roll of 12 figure raises after adjusting for any modifiers. Right, so we don't even factor this as a raise until we add. So let's say I have a plus two for point blank range. I'm, I'm gonna shoot a guy in the literally a point blank range. I might get a plus two by the GM, uh, right? And so I roll, let's say I roll a 10, but that plus two gives me a 12. Technically, I will have raised twice. Bang, bang, All right? All unskilled checks are on the D are with a D4. Remember, D6 is considered average. Right, so when you start your character out, everything's a D4. You spend your points to raise dice, right? So if you just want to raise your character to average in every category, you just spend one point in all five starting attributes, and your character would be an average Joe across the board, right? So that's kind of neat, right? There's all kinds of roles. There's cooperative roles, group roles. Um, there is um, uh, opposed roles. And then we get to initiative. Initiative is you, we use a deck of cards, right? You use a standard deck of playing cards. Jokers are remain in the deck. Uh, GM shuffles those cards and deals out initiative card, and you flip it over, and then everybody on the table can see, uh, you know, uh, who's going on this in, in this round. So that's very cool because then we can see who's going. And what's really cool is if there are henchmen in our group. Let's say it's me and Dell playing. Um, uh, Savage Worlds, and we are we are uh, leading a platoon of of uh, um, soldiers in weir Weird Worlds uh, module, and uh, because it's a platoon, let's say there's um, a total of ten of us. That's Dell and I plus eight goons. I would get four. We automatically divvy up those goons or those those grunts that are with us. I would get control of four. Dell would get control of four. When Dell's initiative card comes up, he makes decisions for his character, but then he also goes for all four of his grunts. And then we come to we come to the henchmen, are the extras go, and the uh, the zombie Nazi soldiers. Um, and let's say there's twelve of those. Uh, um, Scott would operate all twelve of those zombie soldiers on his turn. And then we get to me. I rolled a two. I, you know, I drew a, a two of spades or something. And now I go my character and my four soldiers go. Very cool. Um, so that's uh, just in a nutshell how this game works. And again, what's really cool is our attributes aren't a raw number. They are dice, which is very neat. You can see what a D8 means when all you ever need is a, a four. For the most part, modified a little bit by, by circumstances. You can see how valuable a D4 is, a D8 is to your character's abilities. You can clearly see uh, how powerful a D12 strength would be, right? D12 strength, very, very valuable, right? Characters, because they are protagonists, they are special, they always get that wild card dice to roll with traits, right? Damage, um, that's the other thing I want to get to. And this I don't know as well yet because I've only read through it once or twice, and it'll take time with combat. But what's very cool is melee combat, you don't roll a target score of four, you roll against the extras parry score. And that parry score could be as low as a 2, could be a 0, could be an 8. So you could be fighting something with a, a remarkable uh, wild, uh, you know, wild card extra with a uh, 8, right? So uh, you got a pretty stout a number there to beat, right? Range is different. Range is... Always TN4, modified by the ranges, right? Two, four, six, or of course cover, um, shooting at a moving object, those kind of things. So range is still a TN4 for the most part. But damage is cool because you have to first shake uh, the enemy or be shook. And then anything above shake can create a wound. So similar to blowing up 
uh, for raises. A raise will cause wounds. So let's say, let uh, and this is against, by the way, for for um, uh, for damage. It's against the enemy's toughness, right? Your toughness or the extra's toughness, right? So you have to score damage above that. So let's say we're fighting a Nazi um, zombie soldier, and boom, it's a six uh, toughness score, right? Extra toughness. And I roll two dice six for my weapon, and I roll a seven. Well, I did indeed shake him, but to do actual wound well actually this thing would be an extra it probably be it might just kill him or do wounds automatically but let's say it's a let's say it's the ss lieutenant of the zombies right and he's a, he's an actual uh wild card he's an actual um threat equal to us this would just shake him right but here's what's cool i've already shaken him on my turn right so the nazi ss commander is shaken dell now unloads his 50 his Thompson uh, into this guy, and let's say Dell successfully hits him, and then Dell rolls his three die six and gets a thirteen. That all that thirteen would go against him as wounds, which is very cool. Here's another thing that makes Savage World so interesting. Uh, it, uh, I guess edges can affect combat, of course, as well as other things. Hindrances can affect combat as well as other things. But here's what's really cool about Savage Worlds. It's my go. Let's say let's let's use an example of Mothership the other night, right? We're in this stalemate conversation. It's really role play at this point versus GM Fiat. I'm role playing my character. Uh, uh, Justin knows the demeanor of the android uh, monster. He gives me an he gives me a choice. Bring you know call your crew and bring the ship down here, or or I will kill the doctor. And I said I'm not going to sacrifice the ship or the crew. He basically, at that point, says, you sure? Dell Del interjects in that scene, trying to convince him to save both, uh, that he definitely doesn't want to sacrifice, not me, but he doesn't want the android to kill the doctor. So he interjects to save the doctor's life by suggesting the doctor is of great resource. He can help you with surgeries, etc., etc. This was Dell's robot, Dell's character. Here's a brilliant example of Dell attempting persuasion intimidation, whatever we want to call it, right? And let's say he nails it. He makes that roll and he does enough he does enough damage in that check that he shakes the android. Right? Now when I then she says to me one more time, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I say it would be a persuasion check. I say to her, there is no way I will sacrifice the captain then the crew in that ship i won't doom them to this hell planet and he says that's it i'm gonna kill right he would have hopefully have made a persuasion check uh knowing that the android is already shaken by a successful persuasion check of, of say dell what this creates now is i could actually shake her enough that she wouldn't fulfill that i might make her doubt enough that she would not kill the doctor nor me right so it's kind of an interesting way that 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 somebody could use intimidation in combat to actually shake an opponent so then i could do a wound now that's a bad example what i just said was really a bad example let's say dell dell uses intimidation to shake dell intimidates to shake his op the opponent and then on my turn it, she's already shaken on my turn let's say i i reach out to tear her uh, I reach out to pull her head away from the, the monster, right? Or I reach out to strike her or stab her with a, 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 you know, let's say I've got a screwdriver in my hand and I reach out to stab her with a screwdriver. Any, if I succeed, I automatically would do wounds to her instantly. So shaking can actually be done in another way that opens up a chance to do wounds, which is kind of a very cool. Imagine a imagine a, a sword fight, a traditional pirate sword fight. It's me. Think about all those great old swashbuckling movies where at the end we always we end up with a hero in a sword fight with the with the enemy. And they're talking to each other, they're throwing tables at each other, they're they're moving across the room. In a game like Savage Worlds, we can have an epic sword fight that has all of these things. Dell says something to intimidate the the swashbuckling enemy pirate. 
you know, and he shakes him. And then uh, Adele, on his second action, actually manages to, uh, uh, um, you know, pitch the torch in his face. That would cause direct wounds immediately, as opposed to needing to shake him again. So once something is shaken, they're open to those wounds, which is very cool. And that's about as much as I know about combat. Again, I, I haven't played it in five years, six years, seven years, whatever it was. So very cool. Uh, so I dig it. And here's why I dig Savage Worlds in a nutshell. Um, so everyone knows, for the most part, I prefer fantasy. Everybody knows I prefer dark, gritty, low magic fantasy. And I have my preferred choice of game for that, either old school OSR D and D, or our game Dark Age of Man for 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 a more uh, for a more freewheeling, simple system. But I love I love to run one offs. I love to run different stuff like twenty you know uh, uh, post apocalyptic settings of Wild West. I love westerns. I love I, I mean there's a lot of things I really. I love um, period pieces where you're in the 30s Chicago or you're in the 40s, uh, you know, uh, an enemy agent in France uh, infiltrating a, a German, uh, you know, uh, science lab or something. I mean, these things to me are I'm constantly in the want to uh, play or put those kind of sessions in front of people. But I don't have one. I don't have one system that does all of these things well. That's why I'm looking at Savage Worlds. In a nutshell, that's why Savage Worlds. This would be perfect for sci-fi pulp. This would be perfect for Indiana Jones. This would be perfect for for uh, uh, Blade Runner. This would be perfect for um, you know post-apocalyptic stuff. I'm absolutely. Um, uh, this is why I'm I'm looking at Savage Worlds uh, and uh, interested in, in uh, running it in future. Okay. Cons. Right, there's really only one big con here for me. Uh, number one, it is skill based, and I've always said this before. I've never been a fan of skill based games because it, it makes players feel like they can't do something, uh, or it pigeonholes players into constantly looking at their character sheet, going, "How do I? I want to use my. I want to use this skill now. I want to use this skill now." I'm okay, so this is this. These are the cons for me. However, uh, know this: all non-skill checks start at D4. So if somebody says, "I want to, I want to engineer a raft." out of these components and we all go, well, you know, you don't really have it. Well, good luck. It's going to be a D4 check uh, to engineer some kind of floating device. Uh, we don't know how good that device will be, but you could put together something you could float on right out here in the middle of the ocean kind of thing. Okay. But it wouldn't be a, a freaking raft. You could put your feet up, lay back, you know. Okay. They would start with a D4 if they don't have any of those kind of skills, right? So, uh, but cons, cons for me is skill-based, right? I'm not a fan of skill-based. Uh, but the big con for me is maps and minis are implied. Uh, and now it makes it clear you can convert and do theater of the mind, yards, uh, or, or feet. But it is everything is assuming you're going to use maps and minis. Those are the two things that I think probably, I, I would argue, when I first got Savage Worlds, I would have been instantly turned off uh, by maps and minis. And probably by skills, right? Because at the time I got this in 2012, I, I was still fairly inexperienced with playing in other systems or running other systems. Um, I had not been exposed to how a skill-based game can feel. Uh, I have since learned I really uh, dig as a player skill-based games, and I don't hate skill-based games. But boy, when I would have... Uh, first got my hands on Savage Worlds, those are things that me would have been, dang it, uh, they would have been red flag things. This isn't simple. This is complicated. You know, the minute you throw skills at, at me, I start thinking we're getting complicated here, right? I got to know how all those skills work. I got to know what all those skills trigger. Talents, feats, that's it. So talents and feats in D&D made me angry, right? Because now I'm like, oh, you know, I've got six guys at my table. They're all level four and seven of them all have these different feats and shit. And I got to know all that stuff, and then it's going to come up and play. And invariably, the players go, okay, I'll use my feet here, you know, and it's just constantly, you know. So that was that's my issue with that. Um, anyway, and then maps and minis. I have always been a theater of the mind guy. Uh, we, If I have to, I'll, I'll put a salt shaker and a pepper shaker in the middle of the table and say, okay, here's you. Here's the, here's the, here, here's your distance from the edge of the, the crevice. You know, and here's where the, and I, you know, you line up the utensils and say, here's roughly where the goblins are coming from, you know, or I'd sketch it out on a quick thing so they could get tactical idea what where they're at in their head. But so those things would have turned me off immediately. Outside of that, 
I really dug uh, how the system works. The other thing that would probably would have been tough for me to get my head around at the time was not bennies because I often want to award players with genius role play by just giving them a bonus to their next role, right? So I very often in D&D would say, dude, that's genius. Get plus one to this role. Dude, that's amazing. Plus two to your next role, right? Um, but the other thing that I probably would have um, struggled with would literally have been what raises look like uh, um, narratively. Right, so in D and D, uh, traditionally, you roll a twenty, we all go, "Whoa, crit!" We all can imagine that was a pretty successful thing. But I probably would have balked at what raises actually mean. But that would have been because I might not have understood that the raises help you get over those negative modifiers, not just right. Um, so anyway, that's my take on Savage Worlds, the deluxe book. Uh, it is, it is uh, fantastic system I, I believe it would be the system I would choose to run for anything non uh, traditional fantasy and I don't know it might be a, it might be great for fantasy it's just a kind of when I'm in the mindset for fantasy I'm thinking OSR 90% of the time it's just how I like it's how I got my fantasy for my most of my life it's how I GM my fantasy it's how I enjoy my fantasy that particular style of, of game um, you know, so anyway, there, there you have it. That's my take on Savage Worlds. Uh, again, I guarantee you, I won't know it as well yet. I'll have to read through it again. I will have to play it a couple of times. I certainly uh, will be running this, and um, <clears throat> uh, my goal, um, outside of uh, outside of a little fantasy um, stuff and test playing Dark Age of Man, at some point I will stretch out to offer uh, Wild West type games or. Uh, uh, games set in the 30s or 40s, um, that type of thing, uh, 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 pulp adventure type stuff. And again, I think it would be Savage Worlds I would choose to run. But again, that's down the road. I won't start running anything outside of Dark Age of Man or a little uh, old school OSR until probably September, October. I've got so much to do. Anyway, thank you for listening to this long, sloppy video. But um, that's why Savage Worlds. I think it's very cool. And I'm looking forward. Uh, uh, Scott has reached out and offered, uh, and invited me to a, a, to a session that he's running, uh, and he's invited. Uh, he's also offered to run a one-off for myself and some friends if uh, if we want to. So hopefully, Dell will be in that. I've offered our group, uh, people in that group, an opportunity to jump in and play in that session. If for some reason that doesn't work out, then I will just I will make it easy on Scott and just play in his Wednesday night game so he doesn't have to do two in a row or come up with a second one-off right uh but scott i believe scott has been playing this for probably 15 years i would i would argue scott's probably a master at savage worlds he's written uh material and published material for savage worlds so i th and he's in the card deck i've got his chase card deck which is very very cool uh and um again that's something else chases um uh, there's action decks available in this game that are optional. There's the chase deck uh, uh, stuff like uh, Scott's made here with his chase deck. And again, chases can occur in all kinds of ways, right? It could be car chases, horse races. It could be who knows, right? I mean, I, I think of one of the most brilliant opening scenes in cinema history, the parkour chase scene in James Bond, Casino Royale. One of the, I think one of the most amazing opening scenes in a film I've ever seen uh, when he's in that foot parkour chase chasing that guy through the construction site the terrorist brilliant brilliant opening scene of the when uh, uh daniel craig's debut as james bond was a masterpiece and that that opening scene set the tone for this ain't your daddy's james bond right this isn't your 80s goofy ass james bond right so i loved that anyway uh that's the other thing secret agent stuff i used to love top secret savage worlds i think would be the perfect animal for running uh, that kind of uh, born, uh, uh, born, uh, the born series, or the James or James Bond s kind of secret agent game. I I love that. I think Savage Worlds would be perfect for that. Absolutely perfect for that. So anyway, I'm out. Thank you for listening. Good day.